Hello, this is Steven now, and yes, we are back with another Green Hornet 66 episode review. And today, we are in finally to the two parter of the Green Hornet series, the final two episodes of the series. The first part is, of course, Invasion from Outer Space Part 1. So, without any further ado, let's get straight into this review. We begin this episode at Britt Reed's place, where Britt Reed, Kato, and Casey are all there essentially, you know, going through some last minute work before Britt Reed goes on his supposed date. But just as that happened, they get a sudden news announcement with reports of a supposed flying saucer landing outside on the skirts of the city. They can't believe the whole thing and find the whole thing, and Britt Reed finds the whole thing to be a farce. That is until the supposed intrude and supposed intruders come bursting into the place and end up and ends up zapping Kato unconscious with the leader revealing himself this is a pretty good way to start the episode as it's coming out of nowhere it's it's bizarre and it raises questions and that's what an epi episode opening should really do raise some questions after that they uh, basically say Kato's been unconscious nothing is you know he's not in that much harm Eventually, they reveal to Britt Reed that they are, of course, aliens from outer space. Their, their flying saucer has landed, you know, on the outskirts of the city. And basically, they need Britt Reed's help to essentially help, you know, dial down the panic so they can call one of their motherships to pick him up. They give him that ultimatum, but also ask him to close off a section of the city to essentially... Well, you know, so they, you know, an easier place to be picked up. Britt Reed complies first by, you know, using his influence by having an all, you know, like, emergency, you know, where he tells the citizens to stay calm until all the facts are taken in, and essentially everyone, you know, just to stay calm until the crisis has been averted. He then calls Scanlan and asks them to, you know, cut off, like, the road, where the certain section that the leader has requested. I, one thing I like is, throughout all this, Britt Reed does not believe that they are aliens. He thinks something is off. And in order to make sure Britt Reed does come, you know, comply with this, he basically says that their mothership is floating above them, and with and they feel provocated, they could fire upon the city, therefore endangering thousands of lives, and, of course, destroy the city. But throughout this whole sequence, the leader of these group of aliens is clearly being attracted to Casey, and kind of, you know, I think, you think really kind of caught her in the traditional supervillain trope of, you know, our beautiful lady, you know, all powering mumbo, jumbo, the whole shtick. After the end of it, of course, the leader takes Casey as a hostage to make sure that, you know, nothing bad will happen. On their way out, they end up electrocuting Reed and Kato, essentially knocking them out unconscious. The leader and his crew take Casey to a central hideout within, I'm presuming, the... F uh, the outskirts of the city clearly in a forest as casey gets in it's clearly revealed to them that they are obviously not aliens they're just people pretending to be aliens the leader of course of this crew is a, is obviously a scientist but a person who views himself as vastly superior to everyone around him i kind of love i really like this because we're giving a unique villain here who's very colorful very flamboyant but also someone not to be messed with i think the closest the series had to i think a deranged and almost completely out of control maniacal well, maniac, and I really love that. We get back to Britt Reed and Kato, who are, you know, are wearing off all the, you know, that they've, their recent encounter, you know, they're waking up, they're getting out from their unconsciousness, if you would call it. And it's in this moment where Frank Scanlon comes in and asks, you know, what's happened? And also informs them that the the thing they've basically told, you know, the, the road to be cut off, a new U.S. Air Force is coming by with some electronic equipment, top secret stuff, but they believe it to be a nuclear warhead or a H-bomb missile warhead. Um, Britt Reed realizes, of course, that it is the area where they've asked to be cleared, and they realize the leader of the aliens from 10 years ago of a story he covered... He was a scientist who got booted out of the Atomic Energy Program for conducting unauthorized nuclear experiments. He destroyed million-dollar tests, you know, equipment, and killed two lab assistant, uh, assistants. Realizing they're clearly dealing with a madman, and also that they have Casey in their power, they realize that you know that they have to find a way to you know solve this before it gets out of control. Frank Scanlon goes to obviously deal with the situation on his side of the fence. But for Britt Reed and Kato, they have to deal with their side of the fence. They dress up as the Green Horde and Kato, and basically go driving trying to find Casey. Obviously, you know, trying to find, you know, some common ground. 
whilst, you know, Britt Reed is, you know, manu- uh, memor- you know, obviously praying that they don't harm Casey, he then realised the scientist's name, Dr. Eric Mabuse. That was the scientist. And more than that, Britt Reed realised they're dealing with a man, um, you know, who is obviously a brilliant mind, but also just as mad. A worse combination for any supervillain, in my opinion. We then cut to, essentially, Mabuse and his crew monitoring the army calls as they, as they, as the convoy is going through this blocked off section of the highway. As as they're hearing that, we find, find out that Casey is not a person, you know, who can be heavily intimidated. Even though Mabuse is clearly trying to court her in the classic super villainy trope, he basically announces his plan, he plans to steal the warhead, and basically plans to detonate it if his demands are obviously not met. This guy obviously views himself as, you know, he was the victim of the whole thing, and he views himself to be far superior than anyone else around him, and I think maybe some of his guys are a bit creeped of him, but also the henchman Valor, or henchwoman Valor, is clearly some kind of zombie. I don't know what he's done to make her this obedient to him, but it does wonder what, you know, how did he come up with all this? But I be- but unlike, I guess you could say for King Tut, where you question it, for here, I, it's a plausible explanation, because he is a smart and brilliant man. It's easy for me to buy that he would create all this. Anyway, we also find out that Casey is, of course, not a, pers- a woman to be heavily intimidated. She uses an opportunity to plan a... Uh, tracking device on one of the henchmen, but also cause an explosion to Mabusa's equipment. There, she quickly make after the explosion, she quickly makes a run for it, gets in a car and drives off. Mabuse orders his men to quickly capture capture her. They too get in a car, we get a car chase. It's also here where the Green Hornet picks up a tracking system, and of course, they track, you know, where Casey is going. But however, Mabusa's equipment is not that badly destroyed, in fact, it's still operational. In fact, it's only really slowed him down, only slowed him down, but not that much. Casey, however, does end up crashing the car, and as a result, um, has runs it on foot to what I'm assuming is some kind of steelworks factory, where she is encountered by the goons. Kato and Green Hornet quickly arrive, but Casey ends up getting her, I guess, arm locked into a conveyor belt and it slowly goes into like a fire pit inferno but just as that happening green hornet and kato quickly come in and dispense with the goons uh the goons quickly make their escape and green hornet saves casey just in the nick of time before she is thrown into pretty much the inferno but just as that's happening we see mabuz and the rest of his henchmen essentially ambush the convoy and essentially you know threatens to you know turn the bomb off where they stand and he has a device that will make the bomb go off immediately if they do not hand it over to him and it's a really interesting cliffhanger as i could really buy if they don't go through with it he is willing you know to have the bomb go off it's a really great cliffhanger so far to a really great episode uh the interesting uh thing here is uh we don't have Mike Axford at all. It's only Frank Scanlon here, who honestly plays his usual bit role, I guess more in the same vein that Commissioner Gordon always did in the original Batman series, um, which is kind of a bit of a shame, you know, we don't get Mike Axford, but, you know, I don't really think he would fit well in this episode. I love, however, we are getting Casey a bit of a role, or something really to do here, which rarely happens in the series, as, but, uh, even though she does play Dance on the Stress, which which they do, she is shown to be very capable and very smart on her feet, you know, to really get out of the situation. I also like how this is very personal for Reed and Kato, because, you know, they have, you know, one of their friends in danger and are trying to, you know, catch, you know, the people responsible. And it also clearly hints that, you know, Britt Reed is, I think, a little bit in love with Casey, though he's obviously not going to come out and admit it. Once again, Kato does play less of a role here, but I do like how, you know, it is at least personal for them, and does make it, for me, a very interesting watch. But however, how do I feel about the villain? The villain for this episode is a character by the name of Dr. Eric Mabuse, who is of course played by <clears throat> actor Larry D. Mann, and has a sort of villainous henchwoman uh, by the name of uh, the henchwoman's character name is Velma, played by Linda Gay Scott. Now, 
they are very different villains in the Green Hornet rogues gallery, as first off, Eric Mabuse comes off more as a traditional mad scientist, something I don't think the series ever really did, and feels like a character ripped straight from the Pulps, which is arguably interesting, because now the Green Hornet is associated with the Pulps, but when he first came out, he was more of a radio character. They also have this sort of kind of Bond villain thing, because Dr. Eric Mabuse is more of a Bond, comes off with this Bond villain, and uh, Velma is like... Velma is basically Babusa's, like, female, like, henchwoman. I also kind of have the feeling she might have been experimented on, because she doesn't show that emotion, she's very, has a blank expression, and I do like her, like, weapon of choice, it's basically when she raises her arms, these electric bolts come out, knocking out anyone in sight. I absolutely love the pairing, as they do f provide some fresh villains for, you know, the Green Hornet to face. And honestly, I do like how he is this mad scientist, because he feels he's done nothing wrong. He, that, that he's the victim, when he's really in the wrong. He's clearly a man of brilliance, even the Green Hornet, you know, ad admits this. However, it's also clear that he is mad, he is crazy, he is essentially a... You know, that's someone who's willing, who's, you know, obviously he's planned this thing out perfectly. He views it, you know, that, you know, this is a perfect crime. I absolutely love this character. And, you know, but if I could say one gripe, it is the fake alien thing. Uh, I, I do appreciate, however, they aren't real aliens. But it does feel like it might be a little bit out of place for a Green Hornet series. Invasion from Outer Space Part 1, for me, is a pretty solid episode. I love how our characters are dealing with the villain who is brilliant, who is a scientific genius, but also clearly mad and very unstable. He's also, you can tell he's organized this plan to a T. I love the cliffhanger with them essentially getting their hands on a, uh, on a bomb or nuclear missile. And I also like how Casey plays a bit of a role and, you know, true, she plays damsel in distress, but, you know, again, they show her that she's a very confident, capable woman who is smart enough to get out of the situation that she inevitably got herself caught in. I also like how, you know, that Green Hornet and Kato know they have to really think this out. They can't go, you know, guns in as they usually do. They have to think this out through, like, through if they're going to get Casey back and stop the nefarious Naboo, Maboose. But... My gripe is, I think it's a bit too outlandish. The Green Hornet series was always more something realistic and played it more down to earth. I feel that them pretending to be aliens might be a bit something too for the Adam West show. Ironic because they did do aliens on that show and I thought it worked there. But I don't think it really works here, in my opinion, and not that much. Uh, but despite that little gripe, I do find this a very worthwhile entry into the Green Hornet. It's a definitely fun episode. And there we have it, that was Invasion from Outer Space Part 1, the first part in the Green Hornet's final final two-parter and the final two episodes of the series. So please join us next time as I review Part 2 to this, but until next time, this has been the Stephen Hour, and ladies and gentlemen, so long for now.